and I am the pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in El Paso, and I am coming to you live now from the Parsonage in El Paso, and we are so glad that you are joining us. And when I say we, I mean Micha and myself. Micha is always on the other side of the camera assisting us in our conversation. So welcome to you all as you are connecting here this morning on this beautiful morning in May. We are beginning a new sermon series today and I'm really excited to share it with you. Welcome. Glad that you are here as you are signing on today. If you would let me know that you're here, I would be happy to welcome you this morning. Glad that you are here. We are beginning a new sermon series called I Believe, and it talks about the foundations of our faith. And I hope it leads to some really great conversation this morning. And so as you are logging on, if you want to tell me some of your earliest experiences of church and of life and of faith, good morning, Annette. We're glad you're here. Edie, Jen, glad you're here. I've been thinking about my early faith experiences, going to church uh, going to Sunday school with my parents, watching my dad every morning at the table with his Bible and a cup of coffee. So I would love to hear about your early experiences, whether that is when you were a child or more recently as an adult, because we're going to be launching into this new sermon series about the foundations of our faith. We also always have ways to connect. So if you want to connect with our church and learn more about what we're doing, we have a connect form that's available to you as you sign in. And also, of course, we have our giving link. We encourage you to give to your local church, wherever that may be, because we are continuing, our local churches are continuing in our mission, and your faithful giving is really helpful. So thank you, members of St. Paul's United Methodist Church, who continue to give so faithfully. Welcome, Kathy. Glad you're here. Hi, Martha. Hope you're feeling well this morning. Terry, glad you're here. Pop, so glad you're here. I was just bragging on you for your faithful reading of the Bible. I also remember the felt boards that were in the Sunday school classes when I was young that had the illustrated characters of the Bible to teach us. Do any of you remember those? I remember learning to find the different books in the Bible and Bible drills. I remember memorizing scripture. I remember being baptized with my parents. And so if you have early experiences of faith that you would like to share this morning, I would love to hear about those. Hi, David. We're glad you're here this morning because we are beginning this new sermon series called I Believe. And we're starting with this passage from 1 Peter chapter 3. So I'm going to read that to you this morning. And we're going to say a prayer and then we will launch in to our discussion. Hi, Janie. But if you want to share about your faith experiences, you can do that at any time. So I invite you now to take a deep breath with me as we turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now this is the word of God for the people of God, and in our tradition we say, thanks be to God. Absolutely, Wendy, good morning. It is a great day to worship God together. Carolyn, we are glad that you are here. Terry, I'm glad that you remember those felt boards as well. We are so glad to be here this morning. So please join me in a prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts this morning be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Good morning, Bob. I'm glad you're here this morning. So many of you know that I went to seminary in the Northeast. My school was actually about an hour on the train from New York City. And so my friends and I took advantage of that location as often as our schedules and our budgets would allow. So one spring evening, my good friend Erin and I had the opportunity to attend a concert at Carnegie Hall. Her high school choir from her local high school in Michigan 
was presenting a concert there and we found the opportunity to support them and also enjoy a night in the city so we did and it was just a lovely evening it was perfect weather the concert was beautiful and we were feeling relaxed and really grateful for a break from seminary and the work that it entails so we made our way back to Penn Station to return home and we discovered that the train station was packed like even more than it normally was because we were not the only ones there in the city attending a concert that night. 20,000 of our closest friends had been attending a Rolling Stones concert at Madison Square Garden just upstairs and so everybody was making a mad dash for the train, especially Aaron and myself, hoping to find seats together. And we did, we were lucky to find seats together on our way back to the seminary. So we took a deep breath and we kind of settled in for the ride home. And that's when the two men who were sitting in front of us turned around and engaged us in conversation. It was small talk, you know, our first names, what we were doing in the city, what we were doing with our lives. And so when Aaron and I shared that we were in seminary studying theology, hoping to be pastors in our traditions, hoping to be ordained one day, that's when things got really interesting. So I should stay, say here, for those of you who aren't familiar with passenger trains, uh, especially in New Jersey Transit, the older models had seats that could flip. So the seats could all stay in a row facing the same direction toward the destination, or some of them could be flipped so that they were facing each other so that large parties could sit facing each other and have conversation and dialogue as they traveled. So as soon as Aaron and I said, we are planning to be pastors in our traditions, our new friends looked at us, looked at each other, stood up, flipped the seats and sat down across from us and began asking us questions. And the first question they said was, wait a minute, does this mean that you're nuns? So we began talking about the differences in our traditions and affirming that in fact we were not nuns and not planning to be nuns, uh, but we had this great hour-long conversation. Some of it was comical, some of it was really serious about the foundations of our faith. And Aaron and I found ourselves in the spirit of First Peter giving answers about the reason for our hope, giving answers about the reason for our faith. Some of those answers were formed very early on, like Wendy's story that she's sharing now of Dr. Raymond Gray. And some of them were more recent as we put our newfound and continuing classic theological education to the test. Now, the risk of having conversations like this, especially with people in different traditions, and our new friends were Roman Catholic, is that it can quickly devolve into a debate. And when that happens, things can turn really ugly because the human need to be right runs deep. Even in myself, the human need to be right runs deep, especially in matters of faith, in matters of religion. And perhaps that's why we are taught early on not to talk about these things in polite company, especially not at the dinner table. We're taught not to talk about faith and religion in public often. And I think that might be because our need to be right often goes hand in hand with the need to prove other people wrong. Because somewhere along the way, we've come to learn that proving our point over and against the viewpoint of someone else is the only way to really know that we are right about something. And the whole point of having faith is being right, right? Wait a minute. That can't be right. We need to back up a little bit. Our text for today is found in a letter known as 1 Peter in our New Testament. And it is likely, scholars say, that this letter was written from Rome and then circulated to many churches in the northern part of Asia Minor. This was a really important time in the church, and this letter was written to encourage early believers in matters of their faith formation and their Christian identity. In fact, early church parents in the second century actually quoted 1 Peter, so it's likely that this book was written in the latter part of the first century. And this really was a critical time in the life of the church. It was still forming. Its identity was still new, and it was still being shaped by various teachings that were circulating, but also by resistance 
from the government and government officials. So when the author of the letter, who may have been the Apostle Peter, but also could have been a student of Peter's, says, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you about the hope that you have, he does so, or she does so, in the context of religious persecution by the government. Now, I don't know about you, Betty, but I've never actually been persecuted in that way for my faith. Teased a little bit, maybe. Mocked, okay, sure. Um, dismissed, certainly. But persecuted on the level of arrest and, and being jailed or being beaten or obviously being executed, that has not happened in my life. It may have happened for some of you. It is happening around the world, sisters and brothers. And so we have to be really careful about how we use that word persecution. So the question arises pretty quickly. What does a book like First Peter have to say for us, for those of us who have not been persecuted in that formal way? It's a question worth considering. So these words in First Peter actually have so much to say for any of us who want to be able to speak about our faith clearly and articulately, especially in conversations with people who find themselves searching or doubting or being downright skeptical and resistant of our faith and their faith as well. So it's in these situations, sisters and brothers, that we really need to be able to set aside, to set aside our need to be right and embrace the opportunity to explore our own faith with humility and with honesty as well. And we have nothing to fear here if our faith is built on a firm foundation. That's risky to use that word foundation today in this way because foundation has become associated in many traditions and experiences with doctrine or dogma. And so I really want to encourage you this morning to join me in shedding those associations with that word because the whole reason the concept of foundation makes such a good metaphor of faith is that foundations are something on which we build. Foundations are something on which we build. So even if you find yourselves in a place where you are thinking differently than you once did about God and about the Bible and about faith. And actually, I hope that you do find yourself changing the way that you're thinking as you grow in your faith. If you find yourself changing in the way that you're thinking, you still can appreciate the foundation that supported you in the creation of your faith framework. And that's why I was asking about your earliest memories of faith, whether that would be as a child or as an adult. So that's my hope, at least, in even broaching the subject of foundations in our current sermon series that we're calling I Believe. Now, I first envisioned this series as a way to talk about some of the earliest teachings of the church as they are presented in what we call the Apostles' Creed, which is often recited in many churches around the world on a weekly basis. And we will do that to some extent over the next several weeks at the same time. I think our global health situation brings us to a place where what we believe about God and the Bible and faith can really be challenged by the experiences of human suffering and death and economic strain and fear that we are experiencing on many different levels. So if you're struggling with any of those things, you're welcome to share those in the con comments below or contact me later about those. But I think we need to acknowledge them because we are all so fragile in our humanity. Now we're created to be strong as well, but in terms of being human, we are fragile in some ways, and this has always been the case, but in the midst of a literal pandemic with the risk of illness being great and the loss of life being staggering, we really can't ignore our human fragility in the ways that we were trying to do so in recent years, especially in 21st century America. So sisters and brothers, this is actually a perfect time for us as people of faith and people exploring faith to rediscover the letter to 1 Peter. Because the truth is, even though Christianity has been around now for more than 2,000 years, the world has changed, obviously, significantly since then. And the church has changed as well. 
And with the speed at which facts and opinions are shared, often blended together today, it would not hurt the body of Christ to revisit the formation of our identity because whether we recognize it or not, that identity is being shaped by our 24-7 information stream that goes pretty much unfiltered before it makes it to us. In other words, sisters and brothers, it's difficult to know what to believe these days. And that's why we're launching this series right now to give us some tools to talk about classic Christian understandings that have been upheld over the centuries and what they mean for us today in our context. The aim of this series is not to tear down anyone's foundation of faith. The aim of the series is not to tear down foundations of faith. The aim is to be able to stand firm on our own healthy foundations and bear witness to the hope that we have in this world because of God's amazing love for us, because of Jesus' brilliant example for us, and because of the work of the Holy Spirit that continues within us even today. So over the next several weeks, we will examine different biblical texts to discuss some thoughts about early teaching, including those that we find in the Apostles' Creed that I mentioned earlier. Now, some of you know the words of the Creed by heart, and some of you are much less familiar with it for various reasons. It's actually found on page 881 of our United Methodist Hymnal, and so I invite all of you to consider the words of the creed with me this morning. And again, it's not familiar to everyone, so I'm going to read it right now. This is the Apostles' Creed. And I invite you, if you know this creed or you have the words in front of you and you want to say it with me, please feel free to do that. I know that sometimes reciting words together can be really helpful and we're missing that uh, in the way that we're worshiping online in this way today. And so I invite you to share the Apostles' Creed with me today, or you can just listen. That works too. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. These are the words of the Apostles' Creed, and again, they may be new to some of you, but this is the form in which we are used to reciting these words at St. Paul's United Methodist Church and in many United Methodist churches around the world. It's also shared in many denominations around the world in various forms, sometimes weekly, sometimes every Sunday. So history and tradition tell us that certain forms, early forms of this creed began circulating at around the same time that First Peter may have been written. And again, this was a really important time of faith formation in the early church. And the creed was certainly mentioned at the church council in Milan in, Milan, in, Milan, in 390 in the Common Era. And it's been an important part a foundational teaching in the church ever since, although some churches do emphasize creeds more often than others do. We in the United Methodist Church consider ourselves to be a creedal church, which means that we honor the creeds and we recite these ancient words together often to affirm our interpretation of scripture. Now what this means is that the creeds inform our faith, but they do not contain our faith completely. The creeds inform our faith, but they do not wholly contain our faith. The creeds are a starting place, a place to build a solid foundation, not an ending place so that all exploration and conversation of and about faith should cease. And that's actually the hope that I have for this sermon series as well, that it would be a conversation starter, that it would invite us to explore our faith and what we believe and why we believe it, so that our beliefs become for us, sisters and brothers, less like a list of thoughts that can be 
shared at Rote, and more like a dialogue about the way that God is at work in the world, the way that God has always been at work in the world, and the way that we see God at work in the world now, inviting us to take part in that work as well. And that's where gentleness and respect really come into play. Whether we agree with each other or not about certain parts of biblical interpretation or our own personal faith understandings, we really need to be able to engage with each other in love and in grace, leaving room for the Spirit to do this beautiful, mysterious work, bringing understanding, bringing unity, bringing cooperation to us at a time when the good news really needs to be heard above the din of confusion and division and strife that we find ourselves surrounded with in the world today and even in the church sometimes. Sisters and brothers, I believe that this kind of interaction will find us needing to back up less often and instead allow us to keep moving forward. Whether we find ourselves engaged in conversation with new friends on trains or with old friends over the phone or across the table or in a video chat, as we become less concerned, less concerned about being right and more concerned about offering hope on a solid foundation of love and grace. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being with me today. I would love to hear, again, your stories of early faith formation. I would love to hear your questions about the creeds and about early understandings of faith in the church, about what we believe and why we believe it at St. Paul's, about your own questions of faith, because questions are really important for faith development and continuing of our faith development, no matter how old we are. We don't need to be afraid of questions. God can take our questions and, and I can take your questions as well. I may not know all of the answers, but again, the answers are less important actually than the questions and the way they invite us to grow together. So please share your questions with me in the comments below or in a private message or in a text message. I am going to stay on Facebook and on my phone for a few more minutes um, this morning. And so you're welcome to engage with me now or later. But please know that this is going to be a, an interesting and dynamic conversation over the past over the next several weeks. And so please continue to engage in any way that you can and know that I am with you and available with you, not just today, but throughout the week as well. So thank you again for being with me. And I would like to send you off this morning with these words. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of our God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer who loves us very much. Amen. Be at peace, sisters and brothers, until we can be again together next week. Grace and peace to you.